Good evening, everyone. If I could have your attention, please, we will get started. Silas is making his way here as I speak. Hello, my name is Crystal Dempsey Gillum. I'm the president of the board of directors here at the Gateway Regional Arts Center. On behalf of the board and staff here at GRAC, we welcome you to tonight's much anticipated event, an intimate evening with Silas House. We are thrilled to have a Kentucky legend here in Mount Sterling tonight. Please take this moment to turn your cell phones off for the duration of the performance. Before we begin, we would like to thank our sponsors for this evening. Ellen and Edward Roberts, thank you for underwriting this event. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> we would also like to thank South Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Kentucky Arts Council for contributing to this event. Tonight's program is being live streamed on live streamed on our website and will be available to view as an archive after this evening's talk. We are experiencing a wave of fresh energy here in this big yellow building on Main Street. We're reaching across the region and around the state to make a wave in the arts and the cultural sector. Our programs are expanding, our staff is growing, and the number of people we impact in critical ways is growing. That's why we also want to thank you, the patrons of the arts, for visiting Mount Sterling today and supporting cultural activities in small town America. Tonight's ticket sales go directly back to the community arts programming, much of it free or low cost for our youth, senior citizens, and folks from across the Gateway region. We encourage you to check out the other events, initiatives, classes, and educational programs we have available on our website, grackentucky.org. And if you really want to get involved, we encourage you to volunteer your time on a committee or an event. We are always looking for volunteers. Our new slogan is all the arts for all the people. And we really do mean all, no exceptions. So we welcome you and hope to see you here again very soon. It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's discussion. Jordan Campbell is an award-winning actor, educator, and an emerging leader in the global arts sector and cultural sector. With a career that spans the fields of theater, education, and policy, Jordan leverages his background in acting for a wide array of creative initiatives and partners. Originally from Mount Sterling, Kentucky, he is proud to be back home, leading the Gateway Regional Arts Center to, into a new era of cultural vibrancy. Jordan has performed for audiences around the world, including shows on US and international Broadway tours at Carnegie Hall, John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and the Grand Old Opry. He has also worked in film, TV, and on national commercials. He's a Helen Hayes Award nominee, and has been awarded multiple artist fellowship grants through the National Endowment for the Arts. He most recently served as the Director of Research and Knowledge at Creative Generation, a DC-based global consultancy that works at the intersection of arts, youth, and social justice. Jordan also worked on arts and cultural issues at the White House during the Obama administration. As an author, Jordan has written on topics ranging from membership models to musical theater history. Please help me welcome our executive director, Jordan Campbell. Thanks. And now, it is my great honor to bring to the stage our esteemed guests for this evening. Silas House is a nationally best-selling author of the novels Clay's Quilt, A Parchment of Leaves, The Cold Tattoo, Eli the Good, and The Same Sun Here, and Southernmost, as well as a book of creative nonfiction, Something's Rising, co-authored with Jason Howard, and three plays. His new novel, Lark Ascending, was published in September this year and has been his recent focus while he travels around the nation on a book tour. House is a former commentator for NPR's All Things Considered. His writing has appeared recently in Time, The Atlantic, The Advocate, Garden and Gun, and Oxford American. House serves on the fiction faculty at the Naslin Mann Graduate School of Creative Writing and as the NEH Chair at Berea College. 
He is a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, the recipient of three honorary doctorates, and is the winner of numerous prestigious awards and honors, including an invitation to read at the Library of Congress. Southernmost was a finalist for the Carnegie Medal of Excellence in Fiction and appeared on several best of lists, winning both the Weatherford and Judy Gaines Young Awards. House was an executive producer and one of the subjects of the documentary Hillbilly, which is now available on Hulu. The film won the Audience Award from the Los Angeles Film Festival and the Media Award from the Foreign Press Association. As a music journalist, House has worked with artists such as Casey Musgraves, Chris Christopherson, Lucinda Williams, Jason Isbell, Sonora May, Leanne Womack, Charlie Crockett, John R. Miller, and recently, one of my favorites, Tyler Childers. House has also hosted the popular podcast On the Porch. In 2001, he was the recipient of the Governor's Award from Andy Bashir for his service to the arts here in Kentucky. Now, without further ado, please welcome to the stage best-selling author and a fellow Kentuckian, Silas House. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, Silas, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's uh, such an exciting night. Uh, I think Kay Lane said it best. Uh, it's the best thing happening in Mount Sterling tonight. So uh, we're really excited that you're here. Um, and so I just want to jump right in um, and, and ask you some questions. And I, I kind of broke tonight into three parts. And I think first we'll start with Silas as an author. So not we're not going to jump into the Lark Ascending just yet. Um, we kind of, kind of want to take the, the big view first, and then we'll move into uh, talking about Lark Ascending, and then I have some more questions for you. But um, take us back in the Silas House time machine, <laughs> and um, tell us what ins inspired you to write. What was your inspiration? Well, I guess uh, my family was always telling stories, you know, and they were just so interesting and wild and you know they exaggerated everything they were just like the perfect models for that i was really lucky to grow up in a really tight-knit community my aunt ran the community store and as a child i could just sort of disappear there and i i, I heard stories i shouldn't have heard you know there were all these I, from a real early age, I realized the extraordinary nature of ordinary life and like all these dramas that were always playing out. You know, Shakespeare said that all of life's best dramas happen in the bedroom. And so I've sort of always expanded on that, you know, they happen in the kitchen and on the porch, uh, right. in the living room and, you know, in the backyard. Right. And that's been my philosophy as a writer is to... I'm just really interested in everyday life of people, yeah. you know, and um, I also was really lucky to have an, uh, a phenomenal seventh grade English teacher who changed my life. Growing up as a little boy in Eastern Kentucky in this small town, I only, had, I only knew two people who had books in their house. One of them was my Aunt Mildred, and every book she had, um, you would pull them off the shelf and all the cuss words have been marked out with an ink pen. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> she had a copy of The Doll Maker you know, by Harriet Arnaud, which is one uh -huh. of the great novels. It's probably the greatest novel ever written by Kentucky, and I think. Uh -huh. And um, she'd gone on through it, you know, and it wasn't a dirty book by any means, but she got rid of, you know, anything like that. My aunt had two books. One was Peyton Place by Grace Metalize. Many of you remember that book. It was a scandalous book. Um, and the other one was um, Gone with the Wind. Mm. And she loved both of those books. But those were the only two books she ever read. Um, <clears throat> in my family, you know, if you were reading, you were reading the Bible or you were reading some kind of concordance of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just didn't know anybody who was a voracious reader. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but then my seventh grade teacher, Sandra Stidham, stood up in class and she read a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay. And when she was finished, she had tears in her eyes. And I had tears in my eyes, which was horrifying as a seventh grade <laughs> little boy. Um, 
But in that moment, I realized it was like she gave me permission to be moved by a piece of literature and to feel so passionately about literature. And that just unlocked something, you know, and I was able to, from that moment on, I was able to be myself. I was able to come out right. as a reader, yeah. <laughs> which is something you really had to do, especially as a bo boy. Right. But I think, a, I think we teach children to be ashamed of being readers. The whole culture does. Like, there's this whole attitude in, our, in American culture that to proclaim yourself as an artist is to be highfalutin. Mm. It's like getting above your raisin or something, which is the cardinal sin, of course, for Kentuckians, and especially Eastern Kentuckians and rural Kentuckians. Right. Um, <clears throat> and Miss Stidham just wasn't gonna have that, you know? She's like, <laughs> There's nothing wrong, you know, it's the opposite of something wrong with you. It's, right. it's great to be this way. And so she gave me all these books that were foundational. Like she gave me To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so for years and years, I just ripped off To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, <laughs> I had never been further south than Gatlinburg, but everything was set in the deep south, you right. know, and right. all that. Um, so those are the main things that come to mind. Yeah, well, and, and I think, you know, educators can be, and we have a lot of great educators in the audience, so thank all of, uh, we want to thank you, wonderful educators, yeah. for what you do, uh, many of whom you've met tonight, um, and, uh, you know, I think that they play such a pivotal role, especially mm -hmm. in places perhaps like Appalachia and other places, too, where uh, literature or, or reading might not be something that's super widely available or, or you know, books aren't, you know, available. Um, but something else that you said that I love is uh, thinking of yourself as an artist. Um, and something that I've experienced just about every day in this job so far is people come in here who are from Eastern Kentucky and they say, well, I'm not an artist, right. but let me show you these paintings that I've done. And they're like world class, or let me read you this poem that I, that I wrote. Um, so I think that that's, that's something that we, that's a hump that we're trying to get over too, is, is how do we, how do we, allow people to think of themselves as artists and as creatives, right? Um, and speaking of creative, I, I saw a video of you playing guitar, so I know oh you're... Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a, you're not going to play guitar tonight, don't worry. Um, I told him there was a surprise, but you're not playing guitar. Um, so uh, I want to know about the influence of music on your work. Um, I think you've said before that you, you kind of create a musical world for your stories, mm -hmm. and I know as somebody, when I'm reading a book, oftentimes I will play a certain song for a certain character, mm -hmm. or as I read, I have like a soundtrack going, whether yep. it's John Williams or, you know, um, that helps me get into the world of the book. And I wonder, um, in your writing, you know, how, how, what's that process like for you, creating that musical world? Well, first of all, I'm a terrible guitar player, so I'm sorry <laughs> you saw that. Well, you look great in the video. I've you always, sounded great, so. I've, I've always identified more as a singer than as a musician. Okay. And I mean, not to say that I'm a great singer, but I grew up singing. I was raised in the Holiness Church, and you sang whether you could sing or not. Absolutely. You know, and so my whole childhood, I was, you know, going around. My mother's a really great gospel singer, and so I went to nursing homes and hospitals and churches and tent revivals and brush arbor meetings and everything all over Appalach Central Appalachia, singing with her as a child. Um, and so in my, you know, in our house, you, it was very common to come home, you know, in the evenings, all the women in the community would be gathered around my mother's piano and they'd all sing and then they'd have church mm -hmm. in the living room, you know, yeah. or whatever. Um, and at the same time, I, my, one of my uncles was a great banjo player, so there was always that. My aunt, who always lived really close by, and was, I consider her a third parent, she loved every kind of music, like everything from Loretta Lynn to Prince, you know, like ACDC to Patsy Cline. That was like all over the place. <laughs> and she and I would have dance parties in her living room. She lived in a trailer and she would always say, now don't dance too hard, we'll jar the pops loose. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, so it was just like a part of everyday life. Right. So when I wrote my first novel, Clay's Quilt, somebody did a, a 
paper on that, and I was really surprised to find there are 75 musical references in that book. Wow. And it got a lot of attention because of that. Mm -hmm. And that was a real surprise to me because, I mean, I wasn't doing that to do anything novel. It was just like, that was just life for me. Right. But every book that I write, I do have a soundtrack and every character has their own song. And then there's one song that's sort of the theme of the whole book. Like Lark Ascending, one of the greatest pieces of classical music ever is a one movement, 14 minute composition by Ray Vaughan Williams called The Lark Ascending. Mm -hmm. And that's the soundtrack for the whole book. Mm -hmm. But Lark, the lead character, his song is the one I love by R.E.M. Mm -hmm. Because he's in deep grief and he's longing for the love of his life that he's lost. You right. know, right. so it informs everything. Um, I never go through a day without listening to music. Yeah. And I'm, I'm also a writer who's been really informed by theater. Like when I was in college, I was in some plays and I learned a lot about like method acting and I really apply that to my writing. So I'm, I identify very much as a method writer. So, you know, yeah. so like, <clears throat> so that's why I need a song to inform the character. And yeah. I like, I wrote this one novel called Eli the Good that's set in the summer of 1976 and the, the lead character's 10 years old. And so the, just about the whole time I was writing that novel, I wore Chuck Taylors. Mm -hmm. It just put me <laughs> in his shoes, like right. metaphorically and literally. Yeah. And it allowed me to feel more like a 10 year old while I was writing. That's weird, I know. <laughs> but you gotta do what you gotta do right. to deliver. Well, as a theater person, I right. completely understand. Yeah. I'm on the same page as you. Yep. Um, so talking about your body of work here, so we've got a few of your books here, um, and talk to me about, um, before we get to Lark Ascending specifically, what, um, across the span of your books, do you feel that there are milestones that you look at Clay's quilt and you say, that's when this was happening in my life, or, or Cult Tattoo, like, oh, that's when I did this, you know? What, is, what does your body of work mean to you in terms of those individual books and the whole collective? I feel like that I have written sets of three. Like, my first three books, Clay's Quilt, A Personal Leaves, The Cult Tattoo, is a trilogy that covers over 100 years in one family. Right. the Sizemore family's lives. And so then the next set of books are, um, now I gotta remember what I published next. Um, <laughs> Eli the Good, Same Son Here, and Southernmost are more like, to me that's, this is a set of books that really deal in social justice issues in a different way. And I'm really thinking a lot about the issues that shape us as a people. Okay. Um, but and then Lark Ascending starts a new sort of uh, set of three. I don't know what those other two are yet. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I, I I think a lot of it in mm -hmm. trilogy that way. Um, yeah. <clears throat> my first three books to me are you know very centered on. All of my books are about community and family and injustice. Those yeah. are the three things that are all of my work are about. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, one reason that I'm often thinking about injustice is because I'm from a coal mining family, but I was raised on a coal mine. Mm -hmm. And so this was always a real paradox for me because on one hand, I hated the devastation I was witnessing, but at the same time, I knew that it had brought my family out of deep poverty. You know, so right. it was such a juxtaposition. Of, it was a paradox. Yeah. And I understood it in a real critical lens from an early age. It allowed me some nuance, even as a child, to understand a, an issue like that, you know? Yeah. And so I think that's one thing that made me a writer, and it shows up in all my work. Um, I think also, you know, being a gay person, you think a lot about injustice, and you're thinking a lot about family mm -hmm. in a different way, because you sure. have to think about blood family, but you also have to think about created family most gay people have been abandoned by a lot of their family. Even the ones who come back, you know, there's still people who have abandoned you at some point. Right. And so you're always thinking about that, how unjust that is, you know, and just all that. Yeah. 
I really love the Appalachian Trilogy because I feel like that it's my family stories and I can return to those. And I mean, they're fictionalized, you know, but my family's in there big time. Yeah. I can go there and see my aunt and my mother and my uncles. And so I get pretty nostalgic about it and I get, it's hard for me to talk about sometimes because a lot of them are gone now right. since I wrote those books. And the main reason I wrote those books is because they started to die. And, I'm, and I started to think, there are all these stories I've been told my whole life, and if they're not written down, I want them to be written down so they'll survive longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the oral tradition survives so long, but then the printed word can make it last longer. Yeah. You know? Well, let's talk about loss. I, guess, I think that's a good transition to Lark Ascending. Mm -hmm. uh, a dark turn. Um, but, you know, I think that this book deals a lot with loss, mm -hmm. and it deals a lot with those relationships and people who are gone. And um, so, so talk to me first, I think, um, why Ireland? I think a lot of people ask that question, you know, mm -hmm. why, why did you choose Ireland? Why not Eastern Kentucky? Uh, yeah. why, why Maine? Why Ireland? Uh -huh. You know, so talk a little bit about the setting and your choice for that. Let me back up a little bit. If okay. I get off track, remind me okay. where, where to start. <laughs> but I do. I want to start by saying that Lark Ascending is a book born of grief. In, in 2015, I lost my aunt, Sis, who I said was my third parent. And I had never experienced profound grief before. And so I think until you experience profound grief, you can't totally understand grief. Um, it shattered me. It destroyed me. And I had, I mean, that, it was seven years ago, and I'm still destroyed by it. There's still a point in every day where I feel like breaking down. And there's still, you know, a day every week where I go to call sis, and then I remember. And I have to relive that whole process of realizing that she's dead, you know. And so I was drawing on that when I wrote Lark Sin. And so Lark has lost everything. He's lost everybody that he loves, and he's lost his country as well. And so I was combining that real personal grief of losing sis with also feeling like I was losing my country. Because for many years now, I felt like that everything I was taught about being a good person, a good citizen, a good American, all that's being reshaped and has been messed with in a way that troubles me so deeply. Um, so that's what I was writing out of. <sighs> there are people at cocktail parties now and for several years now who've been saying, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And so that was the question I was thinking. And I, I always say in that situation, well, I'm going to Ireland. If I have to leave, I want to go to Ireland. And so I just wrote a book about that, about somebody who has to leave the country that he loves so deeply, mm -hmm. but he has no choice. He's a refugee. And so I thought in this scenario, the country that I would have to go to would be Ireland because it's the only country that I know well enough to write about that closely, you yeah. know, because I've been to Ireland many times. Some of my best friends are from Ireland. One of my best friends married a woman from Ireland. She still has a house there. We go there. We can use it, you know, so I feel like I sort of have a home that I can go to. Yeah. Um, the other thing is it works thematically because Ireland is a place that's always been fighting for its autonomy and it's always been, it's a place of survivalists and fighters. So it works on a thematic level. Um, and, and talking about those things that are happening in this country and I think globally, um, you know, social upheaval, environmental degradation, um, so many things that I think you weave into the book so perfectly. Um, and very pressing issues. Um, I wonder, from your perspective, though, um, you know, you're an artist, you're also an activist. Is this book a warning? Is it a wake-up call? Lots of reviews say it's a warning. <laughs> um, when I was writing it, I was just thinking, if this gets worse, what will happen? And that's what I wrote. And for me, it was a way of thinking, if this happens, and if it gets worse, how does a person like me survive that? And what is the most important thing? And what I, what I really felt was the most important thing in that situation would be to retain your humanity. 
And so Lark is always, he's in these extraordinary circumstances, and he has a real ethical code that he's going by, that he's like, I want to retain my goodness. I don't want to disappear. You know, I don't want to, be, I don't want to lose my sense of goodness and um, how to be, I, I want to go through this terrible situation without harming anybody else. Right. That's what I really latched on to. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, to me, that's what most of us are doing, mm -hmm. just as people in the world. I really believe that most people are trying to be the best people they can be, and they're trying to cause the least amount of harm they can every day. That's what we're doing. Right. There are a few people, of course, who you know, don't have any conscience and right. are, 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 any empathy and are not worrying about that, and they spoil it for everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the majority of us, even people I disagree with, a lot of people I disagree with, I think, are still, they're trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. even when I think they're totally wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think they think <laughs> I'm, they're trying to do the best thing. Sure. So that's what, to me, that's the essence of the book. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to talk about, I have a lot of favorite characters in this book, but um, my favorite was a four-legged character, me uh, too. Seamus. Yeah. And um, I actually have two guests surprise. This is the big surprise. Is uh, there a dog here? There are two oh my Lord. special guests. These are my dogs. This is my mom who's carrying them up here. Uh, so, I, I, oh. Silas, I warned him there would be a surprise. So, um, And guess what one of them is named? What? Seamus? This guy's name is Arlo, so I'll let you hold oh. him. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. How sweet. So, what's I better than... Some, will somebody take my picture with this guy, please? <laughs> What's Arlo. better than gays and dogs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Arlo is, yeah, Arlo is the main character of the book. <laughs> and Ooh, being so good. Yes. This is Gulliver. So, um, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Seamus and, you know, I'm a new dog dad, as you can see. My hands are full all the time, in addition to running a regional arts center. Um, so I want to know from you in terms of... Um, you know, as an author, why, and as a, a dog dad yourself, you know, why you chose to make this such a prominent character, and and mm -hmm. um, and tell me, tell us a little more about Seamus and the choice to, to make him. Mainly, wow, they smell good. Um, it's a, just pheromones. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I think your mom has a good perfume on too. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, the, it's a dark book. Yeah, you know, it's a sad book and a dark book, and the dog helps to balance that out. Mm -hmm. The dog gives the book a lot of joy, and the dog is sort of, you know, as far as we know, animals are not aware of their impending demise the way we are, right. and so they're not existential. <laughs> However, we, if you've ever spent any time around dogs, you know that they also feel really deeply, and they grieve. And Seamus is a dog that's in deep grief, and Lark is in deep grief, and they really connect on that. Seamus has, has lost his first person. Mm -hmm. Lark's his second person. And so through the first half of the book, Seamus is thinking back about his old man. And then there's a hinge in the book where he starts to think about his young man, mm -hmm. where he transfers over, his love transfers over. So that moment kills me in the book. and. Um, when I, the day after we buried my aunt, I had to get on a plane and go to Ireland. I had, I was under contract to be a writer in residence at the National University of Ireland at Galway. And so I had to go. And uh, so I did my duties, you know, as the writer in residence. And then when I would get done at the end of the day, I would go for these long walks. And at one point, a sheepdog joined me on one of those walks, and he, he walked with me for about two miles. We had this connection, you know. And so when I got home, I just kept thinking about that, and so that was how the book started. Um, and so I'm trying to write about sheepdogs, and I don't know anything about sheepdogs. I've never <laughs> had a sheepdog. And um, so a good friend, of, a really close friend of mine has sheepdogs, and I was grilling her all the time, just asking her all these questions about them. And finally she said, you know, you have a perfectly good beagle that you could be writing about. 
And I said, well, I just don't think of Beagles being in Ireland. So I, I called my friend Audrey, who, who lived in Ireland the first uh -huh. 40 years of her life. And, and I said, you know, were you around Beagles at all? Are they common in Ireland? She said, oh, we had loads of Beagles. <laughs> and so that gave me permission Beagles. to use my Beagle. Uh -huh. um, but also, I think that I am never more content than when I'm with a dog. And I've always had, I've never not had a dog. Mm -hmm. I don't ever remember a time in my life when I didn't have a dog. Mm -hmm. And um, they just make me a better person when I'm with them. They make me be still. They make me calm, I calm down. They make me more empathetic, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, and so I just, for me, they're the presence of the divine for me. Yeah. For some, you know, for some people that happens, and for some people that's a horse or a cat or a dog sure. or a tree or just lots of different things. But for me, it's always been a dog. Yeah. And so in my last two books, I've used that. Mm -hmm. And southernmost, it's a real metaphor for the presence of God. Mm -hmm. In Lark, it's more just about you know a, a good being who's yeah. with him. Yeah. Well, um, I'll take the dogs away. I know they're oh, the stars. Oh, you don't have to. They're the stars. Of the, you want to keep could, them? Sure. We can hold. We can keep yeah, them. I mean, right, if, that's if they're comfortable, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to They're have being them. very good. This is not normally. Yes. I thought they were going to be peeing all over the stage. Um, so that's good. Um, so, well, now I'm, I'm actually going to ask you to, to read a passage from the book. Okay. So I, I might have to take him for just a second. I'm, so I'm you, okay. Oh, see? I'm used He's to best this. with a dog. It's yes. true. <laughs> So I told Silas, uh, you know, we were talking earlier today, and I said, um, you know, often I think in book interviews, somebody will say, oh, read this passage about whatever it is. And I actually flipped the script and said, I would actually like you to read something that you feel is really compelling, um, that you want us to hear from the book. So uh, perhaps you haven't read it yet. Perhaps you have. Uh, yay! Uh, but if you haven't, we have coffee tree books outside, and you can buy a copy today and get it signed by Silas um, after the pr production. Um, so, but Silas is going to read us a passage from Lark Ascending. Um, yeah, I had a totally different passage picked up, but since I'm holding a dog, I want to read the passage <laughs> about the dog. Um, so Lark, you know, has been on this refugee boat to Ireland. He's originally from Appalachia. His family walks to Maine. Then they walk to Nova Scotia to get on this refugee boat. They ma he makes it to Ireland. There are not very many dogs left in the world for complicated reasons. Um, and he, in fact, thinks there are no dogs. But he comes upon this dog in the woods, and he's sort of at his lowest point when he finds the dog. And so that's where we are. I thought if the dog might come near and put his wet nose into the palm of my hand, I would be re-energized. This one act would be enough to get me through. And so, this was the first time he saved me. Now he hesitated, took one step back, his brown eyes locked onto my face, trying to read any sign that might be found there. It's okay, buddy, I said. And I realized that even my lips were tired, even the muscles in my face. The rain was falling quiet and soft like small feet stamping the leaves. But I knew that any minute the sky would open up. The sound of thunder was shifting closer and louder. Please, I said to the dog, I could not stand to be alone any longer. And so he did, close enough for me to pet him. There were small twigs and cockleburs caught in his fur, but his coat was somehow clean and smooth as if he had been careful to bathe and groom himself on his journey. I leaned close and he startled me with a lick to the nose. Then I could see he was wearing a red collar and there was a small round silver medallion hanging from it that read, Seamus. I took the dog's ears in each hand and felt them in my palms, smoothed down his back along his neck. He was looking at me as if he had been craving such a touch for a long while. Seamus' eyes had sorrow in them. This old boy knew what deep loss was, just as I did. Two creatures can always tell that about one another. It's beautiful. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and 
right on cue, Arlo was acting out the whole thing with you. So it's perfect. Yeah. Uh, that was great. That's, that's, yeah, it's one of my favorite parts of the book. And, um, you know, I, I, I want to, as you read just now, and this is one of my favorite things about Silas, um, is that your voice comes through in your books. Um, but also, you have been in, in um, elite circles in the literature world, and um, I, I wonder what that's been like in terms of code switching or, mm. or the lack thereof, because you've retained your, your dialect. You know, I went to theater school, and they beat it out of me, you know? But, um, you know, not everybody can be from Eastern Kentucky, Jordan. Okay, all right, fine. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, that's something a lot of young people who leave Appalachia think about. And um, I wonder what your process has been yeah. uh, and your experiences having people say, you know, you say that funny or you talk right. funny or whatever. Well, I'm, I'm very bad at code switching because, you know, I mean, I just got home from a 24 city tour. I was in San Francisco and Chicago and everywhere. And, as you've heard, I've said the word dog about 20 times, and so <laughs> everywhere I've gone in the signing line, people have said, can you please say dog again? And um, I'm up there thinking that I'm sounding very pro proper, you know, very, I'm enunciating dog. and all that. But right. I, my mouth doesn't naturally <laughs> say dog. I, it just, it's not the way my mouth, that's not, the Appalachian mouth doesn't move that way unless right. you really, really train it. But anyway, um, However, now, if my cousins were here right now, after this was over, they would be giving me a hard time and saying that I was putting on, <laughs> that I was, you know, because I am speaking very differently right now than I would be if I was with all my cousins. Right. I, w there's a home language, and then there's just like having an accent. Right. So I'm not speaking right now in my home language. Right. Um, and so... I, you know, I, I'm a, to me, the hardest part of it has been being a part of academia. Mm -hmm. I have had colleagues who have said to me, you really need to, you're setting a bad example by the way you retain your Appalachian accent. And what I say to them is, I have better grammar than you do. <laughs> yeah. And I know that I do. Exactly. And just because I'm pronouncing something different doesn't mean that I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. Right. And if I, for instance, if a, if a British person says, well, I reckon, that's considered very elegant. If I say, I reckon, then I'm considered, a, I'm, I'm putting on a hillbilly thing or right. a hick thing. And so it's a matter, it's about the person who's hearing it Right. And the way they think about people. Perception, yeah. And the main thing is, is the Appalachian accent for many, many people is the accent of poverty. And so it just reveals a real classism in people when they have an issue with it because they are reacting to the sound of poverty, not the sound of Appalachia. Right. You know, and so, yeah, yeah. it's... Um, Absolutely. And I, and I tell people that all the time, and I, I think a lot of people just don't know that. And once they know it, it changes the way they think about it, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, now, with that said, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And the other part of this is, lots of times people say to me, oh, you have such an Appalachian accent, or you have such an Eastern Kentucky accent, or you have such a rural accent, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what I always say to them is, but there is not one, it's not a monolith, there's not one you know, just because your accent is now different doesn't make you any less an Appalachian, right. right? Right. And so I always want to remind people there's not just one way of, of having, of being an Appalachian person or right. whatever, you know, or right. a rural American or yeah. whatever. Well, get a couple glasses of wine in me and you'll hear my Appalachian well, dialect come out. Yeah. <laughs> well, the main, the main thing that I, that I did have to, when I think about code switching, the main thing that I do have to, that I'm aware of when I'm uh -huh. on stage is that I do try to say my consonants. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. when I'm just at home, I don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. say consonants. Yeah. And I didn't know that until I was hired to record one of my books on audio. And the producer, we were like in the first chapter, the director, we were in the first 
chapter and she can she stormed in from the booth you know and she's like you have to say your consonants <laughs> yeah, we cannot do this if you don't and you, she's never left like Greenwich Village you know <laughs> she was very provincial and she admitted that she was very provincial yeah, yeah. but she but she also had a point that this audiobook had to be heard by people all over the world right and so they can't just constantly be hit in the 15 seconds back to understand. <laughs> but the one thing that we had to really just come to a compromise on was oil. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> and in that book, the lead character's father is a mechanic, and so the word O-I-L comes up a lot. Yeah. My natural way of saying that is oil. And she said, this word has two syllables. And I said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it does not. And so, I mean, we spent a lot of time on finding a compromise that I could say without having to pause. Right, right. During, you know, where it would fit naturally yeah. in the audio. Oh, my gosh. So the compromise is oil. That's as far as I could go with it. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, um, you know, you, you, you hold a lot of, you uphold many... Um, what I think a lot of people in Appalachia might think of as contradictions yes. um, through your identity and, and uh, you know, you're LGBTQ, but you are spiritual and you are proud to be an Appalachian, but you're sophisticated and you dress nice. You know what I mean? Like, I think there are a lot of things that um, uh, some people inside Appalachia and, as you're saying, from Greenwich Village, outside of Appalachia, mm -hmm. see as things that don't make sense. How do you navigate that and, and walk that balance between all of those identities and, and helping other people try to understand it? Yeah. Clearly, you're, being, you're successful at it because you're, you're, you're doing well with your books, you know? <laughs> but, um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you walk that line? Well, I just I am really proud to contain multitudes, you know? And, and I always want to talk about all of that. I never want to be reduced to one thing. Like... I don't like it when I'm just called a gay writer, and I don't right. like it when I'm just called an Appalachian writer. And that doesn't mean that I'm ashamed to be an Appalachian or I'm ashamed to be gay, you right. know? Right. It's just that we all contain more than one thing, and so to be reduced to just one thing is problematic. Um, but also, I think there's a real, you know, I wrote Southernmost because I think there's such a lack of, m most gay representation in media is gay people partying. That's, you know, right. every show it's most, or miserable gays, Yeah, you know? And so I just wanted to show like the, the, a gay character like I know, you know, like who's a person of faith, who's right. just settled down in their relationship. And, you know, there are all different kinds of ways to be, and none of them I consider wrong. Yeah. And, um, and another thing I've always wanted to do in my work is show people of faith, because I think uh, often in media, people of faith are almost always caricatures, and they're often put in to be the villain or to be the uh, comedic element somebody make fun of or whatever. Meanwhile, most Americans are people of faith, and so why would we not write about them too? Um, and and I'm not and I'm not negating or critiquing people who are not people of faith in any way either, right. but also most. LGBT people I know are people of faith on some level, you know, mm -hmm. and so I just want to explore everybody in all their complexities. Yeah. You know, in, in Southernmost, um, I had people who would come and say, you're giving way too much grace to the fundamentalist in this book. You're, mm -hmm. You've made them into two likable characters. They're too human. And, you know, and they're homophobes. And I'm like, that's what a novel is supposed to do. A novel is supposed to explore that complexity. Absolutely. And go beyond the soundbite or the, you know, the little right. uh, thumbnail sketch of a person. Right. Because some of the most homophobic people that I know are also people I love deeply. And right. that's why it kills me for them to be so homophobic. Right. So I have to write about them in their full complexity, you know. Right. Um, and at the same time, people would say, um, I don't believe people are as homophobic as you're making them out to be in this book. You know, so you can't, 
So you're not going to, yeah. You're not going to please everybody. Right, right. You have to aim to just tell the truth that as you know it. Right. Every homophobic act that happens in Southernmost has happened to me personally. Mm. From having a gun pulled on me, as happens to Luke in Southernmost, right. to, you know, having names yelled at me. I mean, everything in that book. Is, it was important to me that I had experienced all of that. Yeah. So when people say to me, I just don't believe it, I'm like, well, let me tell you some stories. Right. Because right. it's true. Yeah. Well, uh, I just have to say thank you. As, uh, as a young person growing up in Kentucky, who in eastern Kentucky, right here in Mount Sterling, who um, had a lot of support, um, mm -hmm. some of them in this very room, some of the adults who supported me in my coming out journey, and, um, and many detractors. And um, I think now, you know, I want to say that things are getting better, but I don't know if that's true for yeah. young people, if they are getting better or if some elements are getting worse. And so, yeah. um, you know, I just, I want to thank you personally because your work early on in, in my um, college years really helped me to be proud, be able to be proud. It wasn't, you know, I think growing up, it's like, oh, I can't wait to get out of Kentucky and go off and do something big in New York. And then you realize, like, there are a lot of things about New York that sucks, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and actually, I really loved knowing everybody and, and seeing all my friends at, uh, at Walmart, you know what I mean? So um, sometimes we love that, sometimes we hate it, right? Yeah. But, um, but, you know, you, you come no to appreciate... No perfect. Exactly. Yeah. And you come to appreciate so many things about home. And so um, I think I really appreciated that, and it, it impacted me in a big way as a young person to um, see you being both of those things and lifting both of those up. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I have one last question for you, because okay. we're running out of time. Um, I could sit here and talk to you all, all night. Um, and we want to stay till midnight, we'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, so I, I, this is totally unrelated to your books. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up, the holiday season. And so I wonder if you have any traditions. Any for family? Thanksgiving? Yeah, Thanksgiving, family traditions. The most important thing for me at Thanksgiving is uh, chicken dumplings and dressing. Yeah. <laughs> The, my mother, you know, she just makes the most amazing chicken dumplings and dressing. Yeah. Um, and we usually always go, to, uh, we spend the whole day with my parents and then we like to go to a movie in the evening. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a big tradition for us. Um, usually my mom will sing, like I told you, she's a gospel singer, so we'll do some singing after. Mm -hmm. um, and to see my mother... You know, my holiness mother singing with my husband, who's a great piano player. It's a pretty amazing Makes your heart great sing, thing. right? Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, something I never thought was possible when I was a little boy growing yeah. up in southeastern Kentucky. Yeah. Um, and so I think that um, people have the ability to evolve when they want to. Absolutely. And, you know, and sometimes it takes 10 years, like it did my parents. But it's pretty great when it happens. Absolutely. And I think that we should give credit to those people and not just, you know, write everybody off. Mm -hmm. And I think people have a lot more capacity for that than, than people give them credit for Yeah. Um, in Kentucky. Absolutely. You know, I mean, everywhere I go, people are like, oh, how do you live there? You know? Yeah. And it's such an ignorant question. It really is. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I live there just fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Actually, people are pretty great. You know, so yeah, it's, yeah, I get that question a lot too. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I, I, I'll never forget the last phone call that um, I had with my grandmother before she passed, um, and and she had kind of been, um, you know, if you grow up in a culture that doesn't know anything about people being gay. Or okay, oh, I think you naturally are hesitant. Yeah. Um, and the last phone call I had, she said, "All right, I think I'm coming around. I think I'm coming around." <laughs> and she said, "You know what? Actually, I think." I, you could line a bunch of men up, and I could tell you which one was gay. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, now that's, that's, that's called a gaydar. And yeah. she was like, well, that, I'm, a, I'm a gaydar then. <laughs> so yes. um, people, people do change, right. and, and that's... They do. Yeah. At the same time, I don't want to let us off the hook too much. Right. Either, totally. but I'll, I, I, I've been talking a lot about how people ask me often, you know, is... Is Kentucky more homophobic than other places? Well, the way we vote is. And so that troubles me. And I am really frustrated by that. And I want us to vote better as Kentuckians. But 
I don't know how to be objective because, of course, I'm going to notice homophobia more in the place I'm from because it hurts me more in the place I'm from. Right. But at the same time, I've never been anywhere where I've not witnessed that. Mm -hmm. I've witnessed it in New York City, Washington, D.C., London, Absolutely. England. Everywhere I've gone, I've witnessed it. And I don't know that I've witnessed it any less or any worse than here. Right. I feel like it's bigotry exists everywhere. Everywhere. And so when we push it all off onto the South or Kentucky or rural America, we're letting the whole rest of the country off the hook. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I think a lot of people hide behind, you know, yes. well, this is a blue state, so right. everything's fine. Yeah. It's oh, not. but that person is, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like, okay, well, yeah. you're doing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I absolutely agree. Um, well, Beth is glaring at me, so I think we're running out of time yeah. here. Um, <laughs> um, I, this is the point where we have to take the doggies away. I'm so sorry. You can't help but pet them when they're, oh, <laughs> Lord, this one's perfectly comfortable. Look at him. <laughs> is he asleep? <laughs> Wake up, Milo. Do you want him back? Yeah, okay. I think we have to. I could, hold Sorry. Him. I could hold him forever. He'll be, he can be at the book signing. Him? All right. Okay. All right. There we go. Good job, boys. he doesn't boys. shed like my beagle. Good job. They didn't pee pee. Very good. We're potty trading them. Um, <laughs> well, Silas, we want to thank you so much. And we actually have a little uh, gift bag for you from Mount Sterling. And this has all kinds of goodies. Oh, nice. Ruth Hunt, um, some oh. mugs, some food, some beer. Is this a sweet potato? Oh, it's a bird. It's I a bird. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But at first, I thought it was. <laughs> we have a great sweet potato industry here. Yeah. Um, we thought the lark, you know. The bird. There's a microbrewery here? It's right next door. Wow. Want to go after? No, Sterling's got all kinds um, of stuff happening that I didn't know about. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Can we give Silas a hand? Thank you thank so you much. Thank you all. Thank you. So I follow this you? This is for you. No, no. We have... <laughs> Thank you. One more. Okay. One more surprise. So I'm actually uh, going to take your basket. Okay. I'm going to take it back. Lots of surprises. <laughs> um, and I would like to welcome the uh, mayor up to the stage. And we would just like to uh, present you with something. So Mayor Al Botts. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Silas, thank you. And thank welcome. You. So, you know, you give an elected official a microphone, I'm going to say a few words. Okay? So, <laughs> one, Silas, so we are so honored to have you here in Mount Sterling, and uh, there's been a buzz all week. Uh, Kay, you said it right. I mean, this is a place to be in Mount Sterling tonight, right? So, um, I don't, you know, the locals have noticed that we've had some construction going on on Main Street, and I've been taking a lot of heat for that, but today, I didn't get one complaint, and it's because Silas was coming to yes. town. And, took some heat off me. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do want to just thank everybody that was involved in putting this together tonight. Uh, Jordan, you and your staff here, well done. Thank you so much. Uh, give them a hand, folks. Crystal, thank you for your vision, your dedication, uh, your, your dedication, your support for the arts here. Uh, and and what, a, what a great hire that we made here. So. <laughs> Thank you there. And Edward and Ellen Roberts, thank you so much for continuing to support the arts here. You step up time and time again uh, to help sponsor these events and, and bring the arts here to Mount Sterling, Montgomery County, and expose a lot of folks who haven't had opportunities in the past uh, to do things like this. It means so much. So as mayor uh, of this community and as a citizen, thank you for everything you do. I told you, you give an elected official a microphone, we just keep going. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out to support this tonight. Uh, great events at the Art Center, which Jordan is wearing me out. I can't keep up with him. There's Go one on. event after Go another. On. But uh, thank you, Jordan, for all of that. But thank you for coming out to support it, because we can put all these events on, but if nobody shows up, then it doesn't mean anything. So please keep coming back out, and uh, please bring a friend with you next time you come. Um, Silas, we, we have a shared connection uh, in eastern Kentucky, and as you know, whether you're from Corbin or Moorhead or Prestonsburg or London or Manchester or Mount Sterling, we have the same stories. Um, we had the same upbringings. We've got a shared connection through our bloodlines for, that goes back generations for those that cross the mountains, and um, doesn't matter where you grew up, 
we've had the same experiences. And it's so nice for you to come and share your story with us tonight and uh, help share that with the community. And we're looking forward. I think we've got some questions here coming up. So are we, yeah, we're not done yet. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. oh okay, good. We're not done yet. Okay, okay we'll do a Q&A. We'll but, but we do want to make sure that you keep coming back to see us. And I want you to know the door is always open. The light's always on. Uh, we have a lot of fun events over here. First Friday events. We've got Small Town America events. We've got something called Court Day, and if you've never experienced it, <laughs> I think you'll have the material you need for your I'm next no novel if you come over. So, <laughs> but anyway, we apocalyptic, really. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, on behalf of a grateful city and the citizens of this community and the Arts Center, I do want to make sure you do that you don't forget us and uh, put this up on your shelf. It's oh, a key well. to the city of Mount Sterling. Thank you. And I uh, want great. you to remember us and please keep coming Thank back you. to see us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Photo? Can we do a picture? Do a photo? We're going to sir. <laughs> awesome. I have never had a key to a city before. Yeah. <laughs> My hometown has never given me one. So. Well, you, you brag about that. Man. I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I forgot about the Q&A. So we're going to now do an audience Q&A. Yeah, so I was hoping we'd do that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if anyone has a question, we have a microphone right over here. Beth is going to take care of that. You can sit, stand, whatever you want to do. Um, who has a question? Don't all jump at once. Got one over here. <laughs> Let's give Beth a hand. Woo! Beth's our director of operations, currently running. <laughs> well, Silas, uh, my name is Stephanie Chamberlain, and I'm a teacher here in Mount Sterling. I actually ran into you at Vinaigrette in the height of the pandemic and awkwardly tried to shake your hand, and <laughs> now I feel really silly. But as an educator, I want to know how we can set up, I'm not an English teacher, I'm a science teacher, but how can we set up the next generation to be that rising generation that can make a change for social justice, for environmental justice, for faith? Um, I'm a huge proponent of faith. And just what advice from, as a writer's perspective, as you've traveled around the world, what can we do to just stand up for our kids and give them that leg up? Well, I think it's a, you know, a pretty, I only have a pretty simple answer. For me, it was people leading by example. You know, I mean, that I remember my mother was a, we called them lunch ladies. Um, my mother worked in the cafeteria. And I remember realizing that my mother was slipping extra food and money to some students. And like sometimes she would take, a student sh shopping after school or something and you know and I finally started to question that she tried to kind of keep it from me but I realized that was like that was an act of social justice you know to go the extra mile um, and then I, my aunt you know she stood up to the coal company and that was really hard to do because like I said we're a coal mining family but they were destroying our road and you know we were having to put up with all that all the time and so she took them to task. You know, and just things like that, I was witnessing social justice in action and as I got older, I found ways to be a part of that myself. Um, and I think, you know, so many young people are, are held back from a faith tradition because of the rampant judgment that happens in a lot of faith systems. And so I have been a big proponent of, you know, trying to let young people know that that's not true of all people of faith and that they can't just base it on, you know, a, a few particular organizations that they see that happening, that there are congregations that are welcoming and, and are, you know, about service more than judgment and things like that. Um, and you know, I mean, I just feel like we put so much on our teachers. Teachers have to give so much of themselves. 
that I hesitate to say, you know, that we got to, we have to, as educators, have to do that. But at the same time, I think it's just the natural inclination of most educators to stay after and to give their own resources and things like that. I mean, I think that most people who go into education know that they're going to have to do that, and that's why they do it. You know, not all of them. We we all know there are a few. You know, there are a few bad eggs, and no matter what, but. I think most people who go into education are doing it for all the right reasons um, already. Um, and so I hate to say, as educators, we have to go that extra mile, but we know we do, you know. I'm not sure that's a good answer, but that's all I got. <laughs> Any other questions? We have time for a couple more. I'll try to keep it brief <laughs> so we can get to more. Yeah, okay. All right. Oh, Lori. I'm Lori Wells, I'm also a teacher, but my question's not about education. In the media, there's been a lot of pushback on rural communities, people who live in these, like where my family's from in Knott County in the Holler, where there's very limited business or job opportunities, and there's been a lot of feature stories. Um, and I wanna know that what you think about people who say that people in those really rural areas should leave mm -hmm. for opportunities. I'm curious to see what you oh, have yeah. to say about that. Well, you know, the most, the, the most recent flooding that happened, immediately all of Twitter was like, well, those people are, are stupid for living there anyway, and why don't they just move, and et cetera. Well, for one thing, it's such a classist thing to say because it costs a lot of money to move. Mm -hmm. it, it, you can't just up, pull up stakes and move if you don't have the resources to do it, right? But the other part of it is a lot of people don't want to live because they love where they're from, they love their community. Um, and so, you know, I think everybody just has to do their own thing to combat that. And what I've done is try to write in national magazines about it to get that word out there that, that this is a classist thing to say, that it's an ignorant thing to say. Um, and, and, you know, I have a lot of students who come to me, I teach at Berea College, and they will feel real guilty about leaving. And so on the same token, I also tell them, you know, you can be of service to where you're from, whether you stay or leave. There are ways to do that. So I think it's about not putting judgment people on who, who do leave either, you know, and just giving people options that, that, there are, that you can serve your place and your people, even if you're not living there anymore. Um, but at the same time, why do we have that responsibility to serve the place we're from? You know, not all places put that on their people right. to, to feel that way. Right. But I think when you're from an underserved place, um, and so it goes back, you know, to me, I'll, I'll be the contrarian and say, <laughs> we gotta change the way we vote. We gotta bring in people who are gonna actually do something for our economy and not just try to get on the news by fighting with Anthony Fauci. You know, like, let's bring in people who are gonna actually do something and not just, you know, I don't get it. And we gotta change that. Um, it's absolutely detrimental to us as a people, I think. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, are, is there a, a real story behind this um Native American community kind of tucked away in Appalachia, parchment of leaves. That, is, oh. that, is that a real thing or is that just a story that you conjured? Yeah, that's just a community I ca that I created in, in a parchment of leaves. However, I think there are a lot of Native American people in Kentucky. Um, there's a, you know, there's a whole organization, I can't remember what it's called, it's like the Cherokee Federation of Kentucky, I'm getting that totally wrong, but there is, you know, there are organizations. But as far as I know, there wasn't a, like a total community. That was just sort of like a wishful thinking on my part of how it could have been if there hadn't been so much erasure. What I have learned since I wrote Apart from the Leaves is if you're from Eastern Kentucky, you're usually told you have Native American blood. You know, you're told that. But what is problematic for people who are actually enrolled members of, of the Eastern Band of Cherokee is, is if you say, 
I am Cherokee. You need to be enrolled to say right. that, that from their point of view. And so what I always say is, you know, I was always told that we have Cherokee blood. Right. And there's that little doubt there, you know, because right. I'm not an enrolled member. Um, and so when I wrote Approach and Leaves, I didn't understand the complexities of that. And so now in the new edition of Approach and Leaves, there's a whole author's note about the complexities of all that. Um, that's a book that a lot of people write to me about. A lot of people love that book. Of, of my books, it's the one that I get the most letters from, people who love it and people who are mad at me about it. Yeah. 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 I, we were talking about that the other day, you know. People uh, say, you know, my great-great-grandmother was full-blooded, yeah. had braids and everything, and then yeah. they do 23 and Me, and it's... Zero percent, yes. you know, and okay. And I mean, so maybe the, that's a <laughs> the thing for me is, you know, like I think it's a testament to the way Native Americans have been erased, in that we don't really know the history, right? right. And right. It, and people should know the real history, and they don't because there was so much discrimination that led to right. people hiding, and et cetera. So it is, it's really complicated it and worth reading more about. Absolutely. Uh, we have time for one more question. <laughs> By the way, if we don't get to everybody's question, I would love to answer your questions one-on-one -on -one afterwards at the signing table. Hi, um, I'm Wendy Rogers, and I'm also an educator. I'm an um, elementary librarian here in town, and uh, unfortunately living in a time when Fahrenheit 451 is coming to life, like I think we are all dealing with books not being allowed to be um, in schools because of content, and uh, I just told my friend here, you know, I've many times read The Very Hungry Caterpillar, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, not once have I turned into a very hungry caterpillar because I've read that. Um, <laughs> but what, what do you feel like, um, as an author, what can we do to um, open the eyes of communities that want to keep books out of young people's hands mm -hmm. because of the content, whether it be um, because there's a gay character. You know, in elementary school, we don't really deal a lot with gay characters, but I have beautiful books by Patricia Polacco where two mothers are raising children from mm -hmm. countries everywhere that has now, you know, we're not allowed to read that. In, um, it's a part of our fourth grade reading series and we're not allowed to read it. So what, what do you think as an author? What can people like me in a lowly position that I'm in, what can we do to open that up and to make people see that literature is a powerful tool for everybody and that a message such as a gay character is mm -hmm. not going to turn your child gay or, right. yeah. Well, you know, the main thing is I read a lot of books about straight people and it doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the main thing I tell people. Didn't work. Right. Didn't work. So it, it don't work. It does not work that way. <laughs> and this is a complicated thing, though, really. I mean, one thing is, is that it's a nonpartisan issue, and people don't want to talk about that. But people on both sides of the aisle are trying to censor books, and that troubles me no matter who's doing it if they're liberals or conservatives, s trying to stop art from being consumed is problematic for me. And I think everybody should have you know, their own right to do that. At the same time, where it gets complicated is when it's a child and the parent has to, the parent has to be involved. And so you know, what I would say is you know, as a parent, just be more involved in in what your child is consuming. And I think there's a whole lot of hypocrisy going on too in it, in that, you know, they won't want a, a child to read a book about two penguins, two male penguins raising a child together. Right? That's one of the most challenged books. Um, but they'll just let them, you know, watch people be stabbed and cut all to pieces or whatever, and that's no problem. Like, I don't get right. the quantifications, and I'm not, you know, any, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, for me as a parent, I was pretty protective of my children, maybe too much. I'm a little prudish, actually. Um, 
But I was involved and I was hands on and you know, I went to the library with them and, and things like that. So a lot of times I just want to tell the parents, you know, well, you know, if you're so worried about it, then get more involved in their lives. I, I, you know, volunteer at the school. <laughs> right, <laughs> become an active part. We have, we may not want that. Yeah, but. maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, but as far as you know, after after you take children out of the equation, and you know, I think everybody should just make their own choices, and that's it. And I mean, I read everything growing up, and I probably read some stuff that was you know too. I read Stephen King stuff when I was ten years old that I. My parents, if my parents had been more involved, they would have died <laughs> if they had known what I was reading. That's their fault, you know, <laughs> that they, they weren't watching closely enough. Right. Um, but my aunt was handing me those books, <laughs> you know. She was taking me to, like, I remember I always tell this story, but I'm sorry, I'm answering too long. No, it's good. it's good. She took me to see, I was like nine, eight or nine, she took me to see Friday the 13th. And when we got home, she, we pulled in the driveway and she took her cigarette out of her mouth and she said, now don't tell them we saw Friday the 13th. You tell them we saw Kramer versus Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> and like, Kramer versus Kramer is about the worst divorce in the world. You know, like it's a terrible divorce story. But it was more yeah, acceptable right, to see yeah. that. So it's just a matter of... Everybody's judge. Everybody's definition of vulgarity is different, for one thing, and, and I don't know. It's so complicated. Yeah. But basically, the main thing is let's not let's not take a book out of the library and deny somebody else to read it just because you don't right. want to read it or you don't want your yeah. kids to read it because everybody has different value systems. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Silas. Thank this you. has been wonderful. Let's give him one more round of applause. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I do, uh, real quick, I just do, I do want to implore you all, if, you're buy, if you are going to buy any books, to please use uh, a local independent bookstore like Coffee Tree. Coffee Tree has been a safe place for so many people for so many years, and they have done such great community service in so many ways. So please support independent bookstores if you possibly can. So even if you're not buying my book, whatever book you buy, please buy from Coffee Tree when you can. Thank y'all. Thank you, everybody. All right. You need help?